So recording with dummy heads <laughs> is very uh, easy, but uh, it has, and now people do it, it gives you very good accuracy, and them, you know, can, can do our own recording and listen to them. Um, but they're only perfect if they're recorded with your own HRTF, with just your own head. Um, uh. One application for HRTF <coughs> is now if we have a way where we can record generically and a, post a posteriori during production or during rendering, you impose your HRTF. So you, it will be exactly as if you recorded with your head. It's a very difficult problem because once you record with a dummy head, you cannot uncook the dummy head and put your HRTF. Uh. It's baked in. It's impossible, okay? Unless it's a virtual, uh, you know, virtual sound field where you can recreate the sources and remix them with your own dummy head. Once you record with a dummy head, you you are completely baked in. So the fingerprint is fi the finger. This fingerprint yes. is in. His yeah. earprint, so to <laughs> speak, is in. And um, we'll rely this for the measure. Um, now, with um, the techniques, that one of the one of the applications of HRTF is now. We can use what's called an HOA mic, which is a uh, higher order ambisonic mic, and I'll show you one. It looks like a tennis ball, but it's covered with 30, 40, even 60 mics. Okay, and these mics um, capture the waves as they hit that sphere, and from that information, and what this is what ambisonic theory allows you to do. And this is all goes back to uh, uh, a mathematician in uh, Oxford called uh, Michael Gerzon who uh, wrote the equations that allow you to do this uh, spherical decomposition and reconstruct the sound field based on the knowledge of the pressure field on a, on a sphere. Um, that, by the way, goes back to an even earlier theorem in acoustics called the Kirch of Hel Helmholtz theorem that allows you to do this uh, mathematically and he made it more elegant by using uh, spherical, um, uh, a spherical um, uh, uh, decomposition. I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to go into too much detail, this is again for the nurse, but just the bottom line is that you can, using such a mic, you can capture a sound field, and then uh, using the ambisonics theory and some other algorithms, you can then take a measure HRTF, like the one you measured here from somebody's USB stick, and then either in the rendering process or in post-production, make a recording for that person, individualized. And that's one great use for the HRTF. And then uh, we can do that right now, as a matter of fact. And in the lab, there'll be some products already just coming out that can do that. So eventually, everybody can listen to a, and I'll, I'll, uh, to their own individualized binaural recording. Now, I'll, I'll give you an experience, and I'll let you see how accurate it can be when you do recording with your own HRTF. So uh, later on, when we sit down in the lab or in my listening room, We'll do recordings with your own head and play them back, and you'll see how accurate they are. <laughs> awesome. Great. The theorems you mentioned, when do they date from? Uh, the the Helmholtz Kirchhoff theorem is a uh, 19th century, okay. I think early 19th century, if I'm not <laughs> mistaken. Uh, no, Kirchhoff is m m mid to late 19th century. Now, again, you might have to edit that and <laughs> correct me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, they are, they are from the 19th century. Yeah. Um, the uh, uh, they they are the basically beautiful mathematical proofs that, of the fact that if you measure any wave, not only sound, that could be applied to light, could apply to any radio frequency waves, if you measure them on a closed contour, uh, that knowledge allows you to reconstruct the sound waves inside or outside that contour. That's the theorem. And we, um, I teach a course on linear and nonlinear wave theory, so just a physics course, we teach that without any reference to audio whatsoever. Now people apply that to audio, mm. and they put microphones, and that's called wave-free synthesis. Again, I'm caricaturizing uh, you know, things a little bit here, but if you put microphones uh, in a, let's say, a closed loop, it doesn't have to be a perfect circle, just a, and then the more, the better. How many? Ideally, infinite number of microphones, and that infinite number of microphones is infinitely expensive, but, but nonetheless, you can approximate it with a large number. There's a price to pay for finite numbers. Uh, alien, spatial aliasing is one of them, but generally speaking, large enough number, and then uh, you can, using that theorem, uh, recreate the sound field in principle. There are caveats. There are spatial aliasing, as I said, is one problem. The shadowing is another problem. There are all kinds of problems in processing. This is why it's an area of research. You cannot go to the to a store and buy a wave phase synthesis, uh, you know, TV. <laughs> Not just yet. Um, but these are all very useful techniques for research also, and we, we, we use them. So um, hmm. uh, that's... That's, uh, that theorem goes back there. Now what happens 
by Michael Gerzon uh, much later, mid 19th, uh, mid 20th century, um, in, in the second half of the 20th century. Michael Gerzon was a mathematician who well, realized that well, for audio, when you make disturbance in air, it's mostly spherical sound waves. So there's a way to recast that theorem into what's called uh, spherical harmonics, which are more uh, compatible with sound. Only comp I'm talking mathematically, they're more compact. They allow the description of the method to be much more elegant and much more uh, prone or much more uh, uh, you know, uh, applicable, uh, uh, much more easy to apply to uh, processing and so on. So that's called ambisonics. So ambisonics and wavefield synthesis are, although there are different uh, algorithms, they are very much related. But they all, they all rely on measuring sound in different places and reconstructing the sound wave. This is very different. Both of them are one thing, and binaural recording is something completely different. Binaural audio relies on recording sound only at two points in space, the two points that matter most, the, in, the entrance to your ear canals. And that goes back even earlier. As a matter of that goes back to uh, a very much the early 20th century to a French guy uh, by the name of Clément Adair. Clément Adair was a French engineer, very colorful man, uh, who uh, actually, if you talk to uh, some French aeronautical engineers and French uh, histor hist historians of science, they will uh, pick a fight with you if you claim uh, that uh, the White Brothers are the inventor of aviation. Yeah. They will tell you Clément Adair had a powered airplane of course, they won't tell you that it actually only flew for six inches, only for a couple of feet, but <laughs> he had it lot. Um, but he was ingenious. He actually, um, uh, he, uh, when the um, phone system was set up in Paris, uh, he um, was involved in that project. And then uh, he convinced the opera, the Opéra de Paris, the main opera house in Paris, to put two microphones on stage and then he sold subscription to people in Paris. As a matter of fact, one of my favorite writers, Marcel Proust, was a subscriber. He actually wrote, wrote letters of his friends to encourage them to do it, although he complained about the sound quality. So he probably, Marcel Proust is one of the earliest sound critics. <laughs> but he I actually did write the letter, I can show it to you. Uh, he stayed at home, he didn't like, actually Marcel Proust was known for mm. staying at home. He, <coughs> towards the end of his life, he never left his, his bed. lined room <laughs> in his bed. So, but he would put two receivers, and. Uh, on his from the phone system, listen live to wow. the opera in Paris, and that was uh, a sort of binaural recording. There was no dummy head, but it was capturing the microphones, capturing a somewhat an approximation of the ILD ITD cues, which, which I will explain in a minute, which are the two types of cues we need to locate sound in 3D. Uh, they're not capturing the spectral cues, which have to do with the shape of a human head because they were not using a, a dummy head. But it's only a few years later, in the 1930s people start using dummy heads to realize. So by now recording go way before any of these techniques, but it stayed, um, it stayed mostly a headphone until recently, a headphones in production. So what happens, what, what's the advantage of uh, binaural recording? So binaural recording is when you take a dummy head and record at the interest of its ears and play it back at the interest of the ears of the listeners, at the interest of the ear canals. Uh, if you use your own head, it's even better, much better. Uh, by wh why does that work? Well, first, it seems intuitive. If you record pressure variation here, play them back there, you should get the same sensation. But uh, the reason why it works uh, so beautifully is because it captures, essentially, almost all the cues that you need to locate sound in 3D. And there are essentially three main cues to locate sound in 3D. So if I make a click right here, okay, and even if your eyes are closed, you can tell, your brain ear system can tell that it's coming from the left side. Why? Why, why is because there are three types of cues. The first cue is the interval level difference. So the time, uh, the, the wave, by the time uh, it goes around your head and uh, uh, reaches your, uh, right, uh, your right ear, it gets attenuated. It's, it's been shadowed by the head, it's traveled a little bit longer, but it's mostly the head shadowing. It makes it a little bit softer on here than here. This is called the interaural level difference. And your brain can tell ILD is called interaural level difference, the level difference between the two ears. Even down to a dB or even less than a dB, it can tell that there is a level difference. And then therefore, if there is such a level difference, it must be coming from this side and not this side. Mm -hmm. The other type of cue is the ITD, the interaural time difference. 
it takes a little bit longer for that time wave to travel to the right ear than the left ear, and your brain can tell that difference down to about 10 microseconds. So your brain is very um, accurate machine for measuring this diff time and level differences between right and left ear, on which our survival you know, uh, hinged because our ancestors had to rely on this to save themselves from the, f from the bear on the forest. And those who did not do that very well are gone and have no <laughs> body to speak for them. So we speak for those who learned the lesson uh, and we inherited that, that feature. So basically we can tell ILE, ITD um, cues, we can interpret them quite accurately. Um, but they're not enough. Let me give you an example of why they're not enough. So suppose I stand right, right in front of you like this, and make a click. What's the ILD? Zero. There's no difference between, in an idealized environment, mm. there's no difference between left and right. I'm right in the center. And what's the ITD? Also zero. The, time, the wave arrives at the ears at the same time. Yet your brain, ear system, can tell that I'm standing in front of you. As a matter of fact, if you close your eyes, not only can you can tell I'm in front of you, but you can tell I'm below, you can tell I'm high. So something other than the ILD, ITD must be occurring 